So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our 12th HHL Expo Talk. First of all, um, it's my pleasure to see so many familiar faces here tonight, and I hope you've all been safe and sound and you've been coping well during these rather yeah, turbulent times. Maybe you even had the chance to get a bit of sun today as the spring is slowly um, starting here in Leipzig. For those of you who are with us for the very, very first time, I would like to shortly explain what the HHL Expert Talk is and why exactly we're doing it. It is a virtual talk series with which HHL aims to address latest key topics in research to broaden the knowledge transfer on current social, economic and political topics. And all talks are led by experts from our HHL community. To briefly introduce myself. My name is Sigrid Fischer and I study journalism and psychology at Indiana University in the US and continued with a master's of science in performance psychology at the University of Edinburgh, where I also worked later on in my career. At HHL, I'm now responsible for our alumni network. And as part of this, I'm delighted to be moderating our HHL expert talk series. Actually, we've started this talk series in April, 2020. And up until now, we've already welcomed more than 1000 participants, which we're very pleased with. Before we're heading into tonight's talk, um, I would like to give you a few facts and figures about HHL. HHL was established more than 120 years ago in Leipzig and were dedicated to educate entrepreneurial responsible, responsible and effective business leaders through outstanding teaching, research and practice. We're driven by excellence to please our students, stakeholders and society. So where exactly are we today? Today, we have more than 700 students in our five programs, and these five programs are our full-time and part-time Masters of Science and Management, our full-time and part-time MBA, as well as our PhD program. We're very proud to have more than 60 nations represented within our student body and to have an alumni network of more than 3,000 alumni by now. As an entrepreneurial-minded university, we're particularly proud that more than 300 startups which created more than 40,000 jobs by now, were co-founded or founded by HHL alumni. We're also pleased that more than 130 partner universities are working with us across the globe. It is now my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for tonight. Our first expert, Susanna Mai. Susanna Mai is the founder and CEO of Main Company, and she's passionate about promoting entrepreneurship, innovation, and transformational change in leadership development. Susanna regularly designs large-scale leadership development interventions with global leaders and their executive teams of companies such as Accenture, Allianz, Deutsche Telekom, World Economic Forum, UNICEF, and many, many more. So first of all, welcome Susanna. Our second speaker for tonight um, is Olga Skipper. Olga Skipper partners with innovation and startup leaders focused on growing themselves and fulfilling their life's vision through building remarkable companies that are based on bravery and trust. She has been with May and Company for more than one and a half years now. Prior to coaching, Olga has been a startup and an agency founder and an executive at every possible stage of company growth. It is now my pleasure to hand over to Susanne and Olga. And as it is our usual, um, Procedure. We're having a Q&A as soon as they're done with the presentation. So I would like to ask you to type in all your questions that you maybe have in, in our chat, and I will then read them out to our experts afterwards. So my pleasure to say welcome to Susanne and Olga, um, who are presenting on Build Resilience and Maintain Direction in Uncertain Times, the Real Power of Coaching. Everybody enjoy tonight. Thank you so much, Zikrit. That is um, very nice, um, a very nice introduction, and we are super excited to be with HHL today, uh, Olga and myself. And um, we would like to, um, yeah, give you an overview of the current agenda today. And Olga will share in a minute our slide deck, which we have prepared for you. So as Sigrid uh, was so kind to introduce ourselves already, so here. So what we would like to give you for tonight. Um, so for us, uh, that expert talk would be successful if you really would understand how we would work as coaches, uh, what coaches can bring you in particular in that, uh, yeah, in times of VUCA, and we will explain the concept a little bit, and then also how can you get internal support for coaching, and then as Sigrid mentioned, we really would like to go um, uh, through the Q's and A's, which are in particular important for us, um, so bring your question. Any question is, is really important and really um, uh, we would like to build on that. 
um, because it's it's important that you get your questions out to us um, to uh, maybe uh, can develop um, your personal um, uh, career path a little better with coaching and how you can position that in your company. So who are we? So coming back to Sigrid's kind um, uh, invitation here. So my name is Susanne Mai. I'm the founder and managing director from an international consulting uh, company, May & Co. And as uh, Sigrid already said, we do leadership development, executive coaching, uh, culture change uh, on a global scale. So we have 250 people worldwide in more than 66 countries. And um, I'm also an angel investor. I have an entrepreneurial background. I'm um, in the EO Entrepreneurs Organization Board. I'm the co-learning chair. And I have two, uh, 26, 27 years of professional experience uh, in traditional consulting and automotive and in particular in captive financing, which is the normally the financial services uh, of uh, automotive. And I've worked uh, with, um, as potentially you know, Mercedes and Daimler at that time, Daimler Chrysler, so it's quite a, quite a time ago in various functions. So um, I've worked in large scale change internally and externally. Um, and uh, my large uh, position in automotive was head of strategic planning and strategic projects for financial services and sales and marketing. So that's my functional, let's say, background. And uh, since 13 years, um, I work as executive coach with more than 4,500 hours, uh, certified with Columbia Business School in their first cohort in 2007. So that's quite a while ago and coaching changed significantly actually also in Germany. So I hand over to my colleague Olga for her introduction now. Um, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for staying at your computers for the evening. Um, my name is Olga Skipper and I have my background predominantly in the startup industry. And um, as a startup founder, angel investor and executive coach right now, I work also and focus on venture capital and startup community. Um, the same as Susanna, I'm certified uh, with Columbia University. I was at a cohort 21, so I came a little bit later. But a lot of the content um, and a lot of the discussion that we're, we're going to have today is really based on our common understanding how coaching should work and what you as coaching clients can really expect coming to us. Yeah, so what are the major takeaways uh, from today's session? So we have three for you. So first of all, we really would like to make transparent um, what um, that you know coaching, what is coaching and the differences between mentoring, for example, that's a common misunderstanding here. Second is um, we would like to, it's animated as you see. So we would like um, that uh, you know how coaching can help your personal career development. And third, uh, how you can get uh, better support for coaching in your company, because sometimes it's not easy really to get that support from your boss or from your HR or from your environment. So how do we work as coaches? First of all, we hand over to Olga for the coaching definition. Um. You know, in our experience, and especially my experience, when the coaching clients come to coaching first time, they've never been in the coaching process before, um, it's usually to have a question, so how is it different from, for example, consulting? How do you come in a consultant, consultant is giving you advice, it's really based on the performance and the business problems that you want to solve, and you want this person to um, get you to the solution and give you the knowledge that they have. The other term that um, clients usually struggle with distinguishing from coaching, it's therapy. Um, so what's therapy really is when we're looking from now into the past, we're also um, diagnose and treat dysfunctionalities and therapy um, is a medical profession as well. So it has a medical ethics, medical conduct, and usually, um, but not predominantly paid by the individual. And here comes coaching. Um, if you look at therapy, as I said, therapy looks to the past. We as coaches, we really look into the future from now. 
Um, differently from consulting, for example, we're not giving you advice right away uh, and we're not solving your problems. What we're really doing is using your personal strengths and understanding your inner resources. We help you to discover your own path and your developmental needs on that path. Similarly to consulting though, we, um, we look usually at the business problems. It can be also life coaching, for example, but today we we're talking about executive coaches. So we're looking at the business problems. It's also usually paid by the company, but our goal is really to focus on you and how you can go for this path versus giving you the consulting advice. An important term that um, Susanna also mentioned was mentoring. Um, for example, from my experience, since I work with startups and since I work with those clients that I understand really well and understand their background, sometimes they confuse mentorship and coaching. Here, it's almost the same as consulting and coaching, distinguishing that coaching is built on your personal path and on your personal strength. And mentorship is you're really looking up for someone. So you're looking up to the example of the person who is giving you advice. So then do you want to mention something here? No, I'm happy to move on. So as, uh, as Olga said in the prior slide, so we also have very strong ethical foundations. And um, I think it's important when you would work with a coach in the future, so watch out for those those things. First of all, uh, coaches adhere really to high ethical standards. And that means two things. First of all, everything what is shared during the coaching session is confidential. So when a coach would breach that assignment, so right away, that is a way that is definitely a way to stop it. Uh, the other um, very important ethical standard is um, are really personal boundaries. So a coach can be not really your friend. Uh, so it's a person, it's a professional uh, relationship, which should be not, um, you know, like, like, like dinners or lunches or so. So it should be really stay on the professional level here. Um, the second uh, ethical foundation which we have is focusing on your agenda. So a coach would never bring his or her own agenda to the meeting. So it's everything uh, which is related to your benefit, to your context, to your requirements and to your needs. The third uh, foundation is earn the right to advance. So that means here our typical coaching uh, methodologies come into play. So a coach should not talk a lot in the, in, the, in the coaching session. So talk less and listen more. So that's our standard here. And of course, what we also want is um, that you are responsible for your own heavy lifting. So we differentiate normal, uh, normally actually between a big and a small agenda in coaching. So the big agenda is more transformational. Uh, so it's actually based on uh, quite some uh, significant self-awareness already. And a small agenda can also be really important sometimes, for instance, learning a new skill. But we really want to leave up to you the responsibility for your own development. And last but not least, it's commitment. So build commitment through involvement. So it's up to you how fast you progress uh, in your coaching process. Of course, we give you the question, we give you um, to some extent definitely a process, but um, where we really would like to help you is in two things. Uh, first of all, we want to help you to come from the general to the specific. Uh, and then also help you to make transparent your progress in coaching. Because often people really are not aware of how much program they have done in their learning and their development. And we would like you to help uh, to make that really transparent. Um, what is also important is from the general to the specifics. Uh, often people come with very generic, uh, actually ideas to coaching, like, oh, so I have to uh, shift to that leadership role or I have to develop that skill. And um, so our job is to help you really to come to your specific goals so that you know what is um, the outcome uh, when you have ended the coaching. And here we started already talking on what a good coaching is, how do good coaches work. And um, this is also really hard sometimes looking from the outset to distinguish where the coach you're talking to um, is, is really the right one to continue to work with. So I want to give you some, some tips here. First of all, um, our job is really to co-create the relationship. 
the relationship is this safe and secure container for this big and small agenda that Susanna mentioned. And it's really the first step. You as a client need to be comfortable to share whatever is happening with you right now on the journey and also believe that the coach has your personal needs and also your personality in mind in order to help you move forward. So for that, we're using relating, presence, leveraging diversity of our competencies. The second part is making meaning with others. And again, this may be the core part how we differ from consulting. So instead of um, giving you advice or solving things for you, first we make meeting with you together. What is really going on in the situation? We question, we listen. We listen not only for what you say, but also how you say that. What is the mood in the room? Um, what are the specific emotions that you're experiencing, maybe the body language, and then we test the assumptions with you as well. So there is a big distinguishing between um, what we observe and our observations as the coach and how it's actually interpreted. And then um, we really help others to succeed. And here comes also our business background that we mentioned at the beginning. So why it's so important that both Suzanne and I have the business background. It's not only that we can relate and co-create the relationship, not only the first part, but also the last part of this journey. How can we as coaches contribute? How can we maybe highlight examples from different industries, reframe the situation, or really bring our business acumen to, to the conversation? Yeah. And how does a coaching process work like? Um, so we have three process steps. So context is the first one. So when um, a coach would start to work with you, um, so it's all about entry and contracting. So um, session plan. So some people really like to have one hour uh, coaching sessions, let's say every two weeks when you work with executives or board, so they, they don't have that time. So they have a very different needs in terms of a coaching budget. Sometimes we have to be very flexible, for instance, around, around timing when we work at that level. Um, but there are rules also to it. So in terms of, uh, for instance, scheduling, in terms of rescheduling and all that stuff. So we make our guidelines and rules here very clear. So the second uh, part in that process is really the client baseline. And the client baseline is where the coach he is in the process. Yeah. So where are you in the process? So what are your beliefs about yourself, about your role, about your company? So really understanding where you are. Uh, situation analysis here, we use also often some psychometric tools. Um, so we can do it uh, with a stakeholder analysis. We can do it based on a 360. We can do it based on a Hogan. So there are very, very, a lot of tools which we can actually take here at hand. But the outcome of the first phase should be really the goals uh, for your personal development plan. The second phase is when we go into the content. And of course, sometimes those two phases iterate a little bit. Um, and in the content phase, what we majorly do is we try you to get to reflection and uh, to change things based on your goals. Um, that can be different actions, different behaviors, exploring different options and viewpoints and seeing things really differently because that's normally the best way actually to start certain behaviors. Sometimes also we do recontracting because over time we see that goals emerge so that there's, for instance, when we start with the smaller agenda, a big agenda is coming up. So something what we um, uh, explained a little earlier. So that happens sometimes in particular uh, in our core environment, which is VUCA. So when things really change fast. And the last uh, part in the process is the conduct. And here, uh, so we don't want to just uh, help you to increase your self-awareness. We also would like to support you to make the change. Yeah. And, um, and that's quite uh, often very challenging for people because they have habits and they have implemented that over time. 
and um, and here via really helping them to progress, really not to give up, to build confidence in experimenting with something else and going out of their comfort zone and really executing. Um, that's where our focus is in the last phase. So, and as Olga already mentioned, so we work um, with powerful questions. And um, so what are those questions? So here's a very simple model, which is uh, often used in the coaching uh, industry, which calls the GROW model, uh, goals, realities, option, and will. And, um, and uh, you see, so it, this is something what we apply constantly. It's just to give you a little bit of frame of, um, so what questions are really good? And the first question, what is really good is, open questions, yeah? Um, so what do you want? So that's something what we uh, would like you to support at. And um, a couple of examples under goals is here, what do you want to achieve? Um, how does success look like for you Yeah, after the coaching or after the session even? So we always relate back to you so that you set your own agenda to achieve your goals overall in the coaching, but also for the session. The second, let's say, area around questions is reality. And often people have tried a lot before they come to the coaching. It's not just new to them. They tried things, they try to change behavior, they try to influence, let's say, their uh, stakeholders better. So we want to understand what's happening. So what have you done in the past to, um, to make a change? And typical questions here could be, um, uh, so what's happening now? What's missing from your current situation uh, that you would like to have differently? Or what have you done so far to improve things? So we really would like to understand where you're now to move you to the third area of question, which is options and looking um, at things differently. So what could you do? And typical questions here are, uh, for instance, um, what ideas can you bring uh, in from the past? So sometimes people are very successful, for instance, in the private life and certain things, but they don't apply it to uh, the professional life. So often we try really to help our coaches to screen for those um, uh, success cases and bring them into certain situation when, um, when, when really uh, appropriate. And the last is um, a very important um, uh, area also where we focus question is, what will you do after the session? Um, so often in my coaching agreements, I had also people who came first and said, well, you know, I know about my 360 result. There's nothing new. I, I knew about that. And, um, and that is a quite good indication that people did not work so much on the actual change. So what will you do? And typical questions here are, so what options would you like to explore first? So very nicely, very gently, we try to help our coaching clients to really make that shift right away uh, uh, tomorrow uh, in their daily job. These are a couple of questions um, from the GROW model. So coming now to the current situation, which is, I would call them uh, hyper VUCA times, um, and uh, so what is VUCA? Um, I'm pretty sure you have heard about that concept from the military. So, um, and also why, matter to, um, why it does matter to you. So we have a very volatile work. I don't have to explain you that. So the speed and the change really increased just drastically. And also the whole world is much more uncertain. Um, so events, and, and we all know that from the current pandemic and outcomes are absolutely unpredictable. Yeah, so um, the world is very, very different from where it was before, um, before the pandemic started. Um, then the C is standing for the complexity. So for those who work in uh, big or large corporations or the startup world uh, or the consulting world, whatever, you know that there are different interconnected factors. It's not just you know, linear. We, will, we, we are in a global world. So uh, we have to see the interrelations here and that the increased complexity. And last but not least, ambiguity. So there is no easy, uh, easy way to problems anymore. So there's always that lack of clarity, always that lack of information. 
And um, what we have to learn here is to really go into adaptive problem solving and adaptive leadership. So, um, and that we can only do when we really increase our resilience. So resilience is the number one uh, uh, skill set for today's leaders. And coaching can help as, um, yeah, as uh, Olga said before, in a very psychologically safe space um, to help people to stay calm and positive in situations which are really stressful. Yeah, and um, and sometimes it's um, it's it's already good. So when I when some examples here for my clients, they say I'm so happy that I have that time in my calendar with you to really just reflect and see where I am in, in, th in this crazy environment uh, which I have now. So that's I think where we can help most nowadays in helping people to stay resilient and or to, to, to develop that important skill set. Um, to navigate through VUCA. So when does coaching help? So in earlier times, when I started coaching in Germany, it was quite interesting. So what people understood what coaching is. And um, will you give, give you some examples uh, in a second? So often, so coaching helps really well when uh, it's established well. So when it's, uh, when it's established well through your HR department, so when they really have um, positioned it in the company as developmental tool and not for performance fixing. So, um, so that means that uh, we can go as a learner mindset into the coaching, so increasing self-awareness, open around career decisions, uh, when you have to do some role transitions and you have to learn um, to act and influence in a new environment, or you have to cope certain leadership challenges, develop some soft skills or behavior changes. Very important is developmental perspective. When we have seen um, uh, coaching is not really working well, uh, is when, and we have all received those requests, is performance fix. So um, in my earlier times, I uh, had come coaching clients to me and said, well, can you please fix that person? The person is not performing really well. Or, um, so that's something where coaching is really not appropriate, also from an ethical per perspective. Then um, we are not helping you to develop any functional skills. Of course, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a, in my former corporate past, I'm a strategist and I'm sales and marketing. And I'm all, you know, I also know how to run large um, uh, transformation projects, but I will not help you in specifically to, do, to, to run your sales uh, force. Yeah. Um, one thing which is often comes, in particular in the VUCA times, is that people come to us and say, mm, I need to find a new job. Do you have headhunter contacts and so forth? That's a very sensitive topic. Yeah. So, and, um, uh, so we, we are not doing that. Yeah. And um, in particular, because we are paid by the company. On the other hand, we really also try to serve the client. So um, that has to be handled really sensitively, actually, in the moment. We also don't give you leadership advice. So we will not say to you how you have to do things uh, in your leadership work or in your professional uh, work. And we also cannot make any decisions. So this is where it really doesn't help. Yeah, so, so that you have that in mind. So, and I would like to bring a little case here uh, from my work. Um, I brought the case from the consulting, so one of the big fours, but it can be easily applied also to corporate. And uh, the initial situation uh, was, um, so it was a senior consultant, senior level, uh, senior management in corporate, over 10 years of experience with the company. And uh, his career counselor said, uh, and also him when he was reaching out to me, that um, he has received the uh, yeah, feedback that um, he should influence better, in particular in political situations and large projects yeah, and complex client assignments. And he would like to improve on that. So what we have done in the work is increased his self-awareness first. And how have we done that? So I'm a big fan of uh, Jeffrey Pfeffer and I have suggested him uh, his uh, research and also approach 
and um, to really tackle the influencing skills. And what we have done is we have uh, co-created uh, together a little survey around, the, on, around Jeffrey Pfeffer's power skills. And I have conducted stakeholder interviews for him. So uh, for instance, client partners, uh, peers he has worked with, employees he had, and, um, and they have given him a rating on those power skills from one to five. And he also have given himself a rating uh, on those power skills to from one to five. And uh, in uh, my feedback report to him, uh, we started to reflect on those gaps. And these were really valuable for him because they were really very, very concrete examples on the projects where he worked with clients. So what we have done is we identified the areas where you wanted to have the behavioral shift, so to do things differently, and we made a plan around that. Um, so what really works in uh, coaching is becoming very concrete. So for him, uh, we have discussed his client's projects and also what he had, for instance, as meeting next right away in the next week. And we elaborated, so how he could actually step up more um, in, in, the, in the influencing space, for instance, listen better, um, for instance, uh, handling conf conflict differently. So what is the mental state to handle conflicts actually quite calm and all those things. Um, and he progressed very nicely. So the outcome of his work was definitely that he had those better power skills because we reiterated them with the same client uh, uh, stakeholders later again after six months. And he definitely had a better listening technique I was paraphrasing. He was much more able to read the room. Uh, as a technical expert, he understood that he has to simplify his language and talks from his audience perspective. So uh, the language of the client. And also um, he built up much more confidence because he um, understood that he has to prepare for political meetings really, really differently, not just for um, a technical, from a technical perspective, also from a political perspective. And um, he discovered through all the uh, interviews before that actually the meeting starts before the meeting. So uh, reaching out to people um, to build commitment for the meeting and after the meeting and not in the meeting. So um, that was an eye opener for him and he could uh, definitely influence much better. And that also increased his own visibility in the company and the network. And um, he was promoted after that, um, uh, that, the coaching, but of course, because of his progress in his own work. I also brought a case with me and my case, um, since I work more from the founder perspective and the tech perspective is about a founder in a corporate environment. So imagine someone who has been a founder for over 10 years now, had four companies behind his back and now a big corporation offers him to join them and build a potentially um, big innovation hub for them to see where they can move forward, right? So how to tackle the VUCA world, but from a specific hub. And um, while hiring him, the corporation was clever enough to realize that there is a potential cultural clash and a cultural disparity between what culture he can bring in, what culture he would like to build and what culture the corporation embodies really. And um, one of the reasons I brought this case with me is also to show you that um, culture is not just a fluffy world and uh, it's not just something that you know, flies in the air, but it's something that can influence um, your day-to-day -day decisions and influence your management style. So for him, what was done, he um, first of all needed to realize what is the difference between his way of thinking and his way of operating and also his way of prioritizing tasks of the hub um, versus how really people work at the headquarters. And here the main core word is really respect. How do you make sure that um, both sides respect each other and both sides are open for a dialogue? And um, since I was working with the clients uh, from our perspective, what needs to be 
changed, adapted, or kept in his behavior in order to um, increase effectiveness of the hub. Because we know, like for, for example, from my experience, um, only very small percentage of the innovation hub really survived, right? Exactly for that reason. So we worked with him, as Susanna also described, with the stakeholder interviews. Then we also aligned his values and goals and made them apparent. So how he and this particular person was a te technological person, so the uh, with the hardware background, um, how he sees things, what he wants to build here, why did he come to this company, and at the same time merge them with the values of organizations and organizational priorities. Why is he here? What does the organization need from him? And how to make sure that they overlap and they also work with each other and not in conflict with each other. And um, there was a lot of work and also aligning his actions, realizing what he's doing now and how he would do it in a startup environment versus what um, informed actions based on this observational feedback internally and externally, he can do differently. What can be adjusted or how it reprioritized. And um, for him, it was really interesting experience because this cultural difference wasn't apparent to him. It was just some kind of an ignorance or arrogance that was flying on the surface. Um, but as soon as we dug deeper and understood that um, both hold resources and both hold really a lot of power, um, he could really see um, what cultural differences he should be uh, leveraging and what cultural differences need really to be uh, babysitted and carefully managed from his side. Um, he changed his uh, communication style, um, which was really interesting. It was a long process. It was also the work for over six months when um, we needed to teach him a new language and to learn the new language from this observational feedback, whether the other culture understands really what his priorities are and where he's moving. Um, he definitely improved the relationship with the major stakeholders. And um, it also happened because the priorities of the major stakeholders and his priorities were tight, uh, tightly aligned with each other. And the last but not the least, um, he really increased his self-regulation. What does it really mean? It means that instead of expressing you know, anger or dissatisfaction in the meetings, um, he really realized where the conflict is coming from and could deal also internally with those emotions and feelings, which of course resulted in the more effective communication and the better understanding between the stakeholders. Yeah, and our last uh, content here for you before the Q&A is how can you get internal support for coaching in your company, in your context? And um, here are a couple of uh, ideas. So I think, um, uh, first of all, it would be really great if you could analyze where you are, yeah? Because every context is uh, different also when you are in the, in a, in, a, in a large corporation. Yeah? So when you're in a local country, it's very different than uh, when you're in headquarters or when you're in the region. So where are you? So what's your role? What's, what's your personal aspiration also where you would like to move uh, in the company? What are your current challenges? So understand really um, uh, where are you? What do you need? And what are the critical skills for your current role or where you would like to shift to? Then I think it's very important that um, you describe the benefits um, of coaching to your boss and taking uh, your context into consideration um, and help him or her to understand. Um, so, what is, um, so what is coaching doing for not only you, but also for your role and finally also for, um, for his responsibility. At the same time, I was always suggest to check uh, uh, your office with HR. Every company is positioned coaching really differently. Uh, some have established large coaching pools. Some are just uh, in the in the early beginnings, and um, and uh, so it's really in, very important to understand: is your HR offering coaching to your level? 
uh, what kind of guidelines do they have? What kind of budget do they have for that? So normally there is, a, is an hourly agreement, um, uh, for instance, six hours or 12 hours or whatever. And um, so that's, I think, really important to understand. And of course, also the cost in relation to it. Uh, what also helps to uh, build up arguments is look for similar cases in your network. Yeah, can be also in a similar industry or similar size of company and ask for insights. So how have, how, how have other people done that, right? And what kind of argumentation have they used? So um, these are very generic uh, tips uh, we know. And, uh, but we are happy now to move really to the Q&A and uh, to hear what um, you would like to know. And we thank you a lot for the listening for now and hand over to Sigrid. Thank you very much, first of all, Susanne and Olga, wonderful, um, very insightful. And I've already seen that um, there were questions coming in and um, I do have a few uh, for you as well, but I'm gonna start with um, what I've seen uh, from the audience. Um, it says, hi, Susanne, you mentioned Daimler um, at the very beginning. Do you actually know whether Daimler currently has a well-developed coaching program? Um, the question here is, um, there's somebody who is within the company and who's actually interested in um, uh, receiving coaching. And the question here is, um, 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 yeah, is uh, do you know of um, a program that Daimler already has developed? Yes, it's a very good question. And as you know, Daimler is in a big uh, disruptive change currently. So um, uh, I cannot share you too much, uh, but they indeed, they do have somebody who is responsible for coaching. I'm absolutely happy to share with you that name because uh, there is um, a, um, a new responsibility for a new person because of, because of the big restructuring that they currently have. They also had to restructure the coaching, uh, but there is somebody and um, that is the person to go to and to um, get inf internal information. I'm happy then um, when you reach out to me over LinkedIn to share that um, person uh, with you. Thank you very much. Um, another question. How do you think does coaching work in times of um, the pandemic? How do you personally deal in your company with the situation that couch coaching most likely is now online? Mm -hmm. Olga, would you like to? Yeah, I think what's important to understand, um, maybe Zai has a different statistics, but my coaching clients predominantly 70% was online before the pandemic. So if you look also at the research that was conducted, um, there is no big difference in the results that our coaching clients are getting, whether they are in person with the coach in the same room or they are doing it online. So the only adjustment I would say that um, we had to take is really the tools that we're using, for example, for the brainstorming sharing the files so really digitalizing those parts of the process that haven't been digitalized yet i mean the coaching process so for example using miro for um sticky notes and brainstorming or um also understanding how and it's that's technical and more behavioral how we behave behind the screen because we really hide ourselves we don't need to stand up we don't need to show our full body so how does it really influence, first of all, our relationship and the relating part in the coaching? And secondly, um, how it really influences the client experience of us. So how can we adjust that? So first the tools and the secondly, really the, the behavioral parts. Thank you very much. Susanna, do you wanna add anything to that or would you like us to move on to the next question? I think I would like to give others a chance for other questions. So. Okay, perfect. Um, there's actually a question coming in um, 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 addressing Olga. Um, Olga, how do you find out what the language and culture of a company of your client um, a founder uh, actually is? Did you or do you read examples of your client's emails with his colleagues in order to understand the corporate language or the company language? Or do you study the company website? How, how would you actually approach that? Mm -hmm. There is one step before that, and one step before that is really realize for the client, so for the coaching uh, client, the founder, that um, he has a certain arrogance towards the new colleagues, right? Before um, this is there and this is in the room and this is present, it doesn't really matter which tool we're using, it might not be supporting the question. So first of all, um, really realizing what phrases does he use describing his colleagues? What phrases does he use about 
the processes, the uh, procedures, um, also like a lot of different internal stuff mm -hmm. to make him aware of um, this lack of respect, quote unquote, first, mm -hmm. right? And then realizing where it comes from internally. So what is his culture first? Where is the culture he is coming from? Um, why is it so disturbing to touch the other culture and how is it is it built? And then also um, we can go to other tools like for example mentioned in, in the comment as well and uh, in, the, in the question as well. And here is really about being curious and about this learner mindset that Susanna mm -hmm. mentioned on the slide, um, opening up to not judging, opening up to not saying this is bad, Mm -hmm. But to, I'm curious why I feel it it is bad, or what is so disturbing in this behavior. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's a question actually coming out of the HHL community. Um, at HHL, we offer um, a coaching program called New Leipzig Talents. You may have heard of it. Um, and currently, they're experimenting with group coaching or even peer coaching. And the question here is, what is your experience in that area of interventions at, at a group level? Mm. I think it's a very, very good question. And um, in particular, so also peer and, and, and group coaching. Um, so I think it can be extremely powerful. Um, so it's often actually used uh, along with leadership programs. And what it, what it really makes, it's, it's, it's really also, it opens up the opportunity that you learn from your peers and colleagues, which are normally not in the same department, so not in the same team. So that's that would be then team coaching, to be honest. So um, it has different, um, definitely different goals and 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 also uh, session lengths and so forth. Um, so I can only recommend that it's fantastic. Uh, so when it's facilitated, of course, uh, very professionally, and when um, uh, uh, certain uh, tools are in place. So yeah, absolutely. When it comes to peer coaching. So that needs to be a little bit learned. Yeah. So um, I think it is very power powerful when um, you um, yeah, experience a little bit the skills of coaching mm -hmm. so that you know how to raise open questions, um, listen very nicely. Yeah. So we talk in our coaching program uh, about three levels of listening. Uh, so really not listening to your own inner dialogue all the time. <laughs> it's really the listening to what's actually going on in the room and for the other person. So completely neutralize, quote unquote, yourself and going into a very curious learner a mindset, which is not judgmental. And that needs to be a little bit learned uh, before you can actually really um, have the full benefits of peer coaching. Thank you very much. There's actually two questions now um, on uh, pricing. I'm going to go with the first one and then another one. Um, so first of all, the person is thanking you for your wonderful talk um, and insightful talk um, and would like to know what uh, challenges you faced when pricing your, your coaching services in terms of costs and the willingness of clients to actually pay for your services, how you actually went upon that. Raga, would you like to start and I compliment? Mm, um... I think there is, um, you know, our, our profession is very, very, very young, right? According to other professions as well. And um, this question, like, what am I actually paying for? Or like, how much is it worth? Is one of the questions that clients come up with the, um, the most frequently, right? Mm -hmm. If they're already new to coaching, et cetera. And um, challenges, that you face while pricing is actually really correlated to, again, the learner and the judger mindset, um, because sometimes it's also the learner and judger who is deciding on the pricing. So keeping ourselves also in the position of strength and in the position of power and knowing that we're not fixing you, we're not providing services, and there is a lot of value in what mm -hmm. we can deliver on the learner side. Um, this, I think, it's not a challenge, but it's definitely what the learning that if I'm sure mm -hmm. what I'm asking for, and if I understand the value of coaching in the learner mindset versus in the judger mindset, then the clients understand it as well. At the same time, of course, there is a market value, right? You can't um, just go out of the market and say, you can, of course, there are a lot of people do that, but I think it's also important to make it on one hand, um, priced um, um, 
fairly. On the other hand, um, really um, being affordable to the clients, for example, to the companies that they can provide the service to, to their employees. Mm -hmm. I'd like to complement that a little bit. So um, in earlier times, so there are very different pricing models all over the world. <laughs> so yeah, I can imagine. Go to Russia, where Olga is from. Mm, so that is a very uh, nice amount, I would say. So, and uh, let's say- It depends. Of, <laughs> it depends. In depends. earlier times, it was like that. Or when you go to China, or when you go to the US Anglophone markets, uh, like Australia, UK, the United States, they are much more mature than, um, for instance, to some extent, uh, Germany. So I, I think, and this is my personal observation and opinion, we are very procurement driven mm -hmm. uh, in uh, German uh, DAX companies. Mm -hmm. And um, and unfortunately, uh, often coaching is not seen in its full potential. It's seen mm -hmm. as a commodity. Yeah, so mm -hmm. everybody can do it. So give me a coaching platform. Let's put all the coaching is on there full stop um, so the, the the danger of it is so um is that the coaches will actually lower prices mm -hmm. and um and that maybe certain services will be not at the level um if you really want to have them unfortunately often client, uh, uh, big card corporations they um press down the middle management level or youngster level mm -hmm. and the executive um are they remain unchanged from the pricing methodology so when we go and price as uh, a company yeah so of course there is uh, often uh, first of all hr in it and they have often actually a quite different approach than procurement and um so and uh, and then also it depends often on the industry. So mm -hmm. when you go to telecommunication, there are mm -hmm. much more into negotiation than when you go to pharma or, let's say, uh, organization who spend much more budget on uh, developing their people. So that's mm -hmm. also very, um, yeah. You have to take that into consideration. Makes sense. And now here's a more particular question on the pricing. Um, what are the extra costs for a coaching program? For example, the person is asking, say it's a 12 hour package. Could you give any approximate numbers or at least something tangible maybe? Mm -hmm. So first of all, HHL is offering all, also an executive coaching program and a leadership program. So I would love to go back and check uh, and check that program. So, um, so that's one thing. And um, I think it depends really um, uh, on the internal pricing of the company here. Yeah? Um, so I think it could, it depends on where are you uh, and which country and in which industry and which company is it actually an approach. The company, let's say it's more like a commodity approach. So nice to have, but cheap. Or is it something which is essential to their developmental um, uh, 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 landscape? Um, so it can vary, vary uh, between and also the level. Yeah. So um, from a mid-level perspective, it can vary from let's say 4,000 to 6,000 euro for May, I have to calculate that. So uh, uh, without any psychometric tools mm -hmm. um, for executive, it can go much higher and depends on what they want because they normally also have a battery of psychometrics mm -hmm. uh, or stakeholder interviews. And that is also adding up the hours. Olga, anything what you would like to add from a pricing perspective? Mm, I think you covered it all um, and it's definitely, for example, if maybe the person who is asking is thinking about paying it themselves, right, I want there to kind of warn you, quote unquote, right, <laughs> that um, no one can really coach you into someone or into something um, if you're paying the money, right, so it's really first coming, if you're uh, deciding personally, um, it's really the same you decide anything else on the budget, right? How does it bring me further? What is the investment really creating for me? Versus there was an example of a very high paid coach uh, in, in the comments, right? I so, saw um, it won't be in a different, for example, if someone um, is paying 3,000 euro for an hour or someone is paying, um, I don't know, 600 euro for an hour, right? So this is more in the question, like what, what access to which person you want to get at that, at that level. So really don't, don't, don't try to buy yourself uh, a future. Really think about that as an investment, yes, in the work that you will do. No one will really do it for you. 
maybe something I would like to add because um, sometimes you also get, so we work normally or on a company level, yeah? So B2B, so we don't have any, any individual clients. Mm -hmm. But when we see really urgency of people when they're paid out of their pocket, so we give, um, we try to facilitate to, to coaches who have also different fees and also offer lower fees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's maybe also a tip. So, um, uh, yeah, we often get those requests say, can you recommend a coach? I pay that actually for my private budget. Reach out. We can definitely give you some tips. Thank you. I actually have a question uh, more um, uh, in terms of um, your presentation you did earlier. You said you started with um, how do good coaches work? And then you had that, a nice slide on how do good coaches actually proceed? Uh, and you said, you know, there's a context and a content and then you go to conduct. And there was something that struck me. You said um, you work with um, whoever your client may be on the topic growth as well, obviously a very important topic. And you said you help the person to outgrow their own comfort zone or to push them out of their comfort zone. And I was interested or intrigued how, say you have somebody you see um, would like to step out of their comfort zone, but is, is, is holding on to it and is very uh, discomfort with leaving that comfort zone. How do you actually go about that? Um. I got, I, would you like to start? I'm I think the, the one part which is really important is that the opposition and the resistance, first of mm -hmm. all, it's a natural part, uh, our ego or like ego meaning internal system, right? So we're really afraid of breaking something we've built before, right? So if there is a resistance, then it actually really a start of the learning and change process because we can um, really go into that and, and discover what is actually going on there. Um, where is the resistance appearing, the resistance towards what, et cetera? Yeah, I think it's an important question. So um, nobody would like to go out of their comfort zone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, so I think it has to do a lot with the psychological safety and trust, which we uh, create with the people so that they do a little bit baby steps maybe. And always we would like to hold the person accountable to the goal. So what they really want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to always make that connection and um, and help them to go the baby steps, uh, not just the big, you know, there's no big, uh, a big leap or something like that often. Yeah. So mm -hmm. for some, yes, it, it's all personal, it's all subjective, but sometimes it's really the baby steps which help mm -hmm. us um, to make that behavioral shift, the habit shift and see that it's possible, right, mm -hmm. to go to different areas. And it depends really on the person. So entrepreneurs often, they want to jump right away. Into <laughs> yeah, corporate people are a little bit more safe yeah. secure because of their context. So that's important really also to take into consideration. So go go with the client and yeah. um, and ask powerful questions. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's the tool. Um, and there's a good question following up on that. Uh, you also spoke about um, defining a success or what is success for every individual person. It may be something different to me than to somebody else. Um, how do you actually measure success of a specific coaching uh, in, on your terms um, for you on one hand and also uh, for the client on the other hand? Mm -hmm. For the client, um, so there are different practices. So sometimes people have evaluation procedures already established. Sometimes we help them to establish those procedures and uh, it's actually yeah, helping uh, have, having questions around coaching. Normally it's around the process, the structure, if the coaching was helpful to the client and also on the coach him or herself mm -hmm. so, and, and those structures. So, and then literally you get a rating Mm -hmm. And um, and when you are good in your rating, you stay on the coaching program. And when not, you're not. Yeah. So it's quite easy than that. So, but coming to the personal um, uh, personal aspects of what coaching makes successful for me, it's well actually those moments where people say, "Well, this was really transformational for me." So I had um, one. Uh, I coached one person uh, in a in a uh, also in Berlin in a larger company. Uh, very very so. American and a German culture, uh, very German culture. And um, and we made a lot of progress actually uh, for him to understand the cultural nuances, mm -hmm. differences and all that stuff. And um, and also understanding his own immune system, right? It's like mm -hmm. his psychological immune system where he was like, mm, that's very different at the West Coast here. So, and, um, and what was really amazing after we finished the coaching, 
it's not only those baby steps in between, it was really his, um, well, it was, he said, well, it was transformational for me, the journey with you and um, thank you so much. So it's also, a, it's also good feedback. So, right. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Level. Wonderful. Um, there's a question kind of following up on that. How uh, is the end of your coaching process defined? Is that defined by on the outset or by the client or what is your experience on that? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll, um, I'll layer that on top of the previous question, right? The previous question, the part which is really important to mention, we really measure the, the value in every single step of the process. Mm -hmm. So it's not about like the beginning and the end, but it's also like how we're proceeding in, in, in between. And um, I would say there are two different parts of the end, right? Sometimes um, the end is just defined by the budget of the company. <laughs> okay. and it's very straightforward yeah right for example the the program is uh i don't know six sessions uh, one and a half hour each and this is we know exactly when the end is um sometimes it's more defined um if it's an open-ended program for yeah. example i work um personally with the founders and they define where they would like to to end that mm -hmm. um it's really about the goals first of all that we set up at the beginning at the mm -hmm. entry and contracting where we are on that progress and also what uh, how does the client feel about that right do we have uh, now internal resources and momentum moving forward are there any topics coming up or really they got the feeling i achieved something here and this is um this is the end of a journey for now maybe continuing it later so it can be also not the end by the pause which is also very important um, we can advise, so this is uh, my personal um, value, I can advise on the end maybe, or I can yeah. highlight that, you know, it feels like there is no topic anymore, or we're, we're noodling around something, um, but it stays with the client. The client mm -hmm. is the one who feels and decides uh, when the end comes, if it's not driven by, you know, the budget, the structure of the program, etc. Makes sense. I'd like to compliment that very quickly because I had one client who wants to had another round of coaching, another round of coaching, and another round of coaching. I think it's really important then to say to the client also, look, this is so we are not around all the time, yeah, for you. And also then the the dynamics between uh, the coach and the coachee, it's different. Uh, so it's um uh, so I would would say you can uh, definitely have uh, again one extension, yeah, um, mm -hmm. from a couple of hours or so, but making that a habit of mm -hmm. coaching years by years the same person that is not what we want to do. This is not how we make impact in the coaching. Very very interesting. I was as you were saying just now that you know somebody wants to do another coaching, another coaching, another coaching. Um, you said at the very beginning, it's very important to set boundaries as well and to set boundaries to the relationship. Um, 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 I know we ran, well, um, oh, to actually out of time, but out of curiosity, um, uh, how do you, if you realize that the coachee is very much, say, hanging on to you or hanging on to the co um, coaching coachee relationship, how, how do you go about that? If you realize, okay, that could be misunderstood, do you always go back to those outset boundaries or how do you communicate that if you feel a slip in that? Mm. Do you know what I mean? I Yes, yes, I, I hope <laughs> so. Um, so in terms of, I think it's important to address that and yeah. to speak to it, yeah, to say, look, uh, I feel that, uh, uh, so we are going now for the second round of coaching. Yeah, yeah. I feel that, uh, you know, so and giving really direct feedback to, yeah. um, so what, uh, so what could be maybe different with another coach or maybe so, so really helping the person to understand that coaching is not something, you know, for every year, then also experiencing what you have learned out of the coaching and yeah. um, digest it in your daily life. Yeah. So I think uh, that's also important, but I address that very openly and say, look, it's time uh, to let go of the coaching, you know, relationship for now. Yeah. Perfect. So transparency is a good yeah. solution. Um, I am seeing another question, um, which I'm going to um, uh, um, propose to Olga. Olga, how is value measured? Um, is the question coming in here? Is the last question with a smiley? <laughs> by the client. Yeah. <laughs> what do you say by them? By the client. 
right? Oh, so yeah. it's uh, that's why I'm saying that it's the whole process is also the value measuring exercise because what you value and what I value might be completely different things. Um, yeah. Let's take a very, very simple example, right? Um, I might like, I don't know, fashionable bags and I'm ready to pay for them the amount they're, they're asking me for, but you have no value in that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, so that's very important conversation to have. What is the value? Mm -hmm. What are we actually creating mm -hmm. here? What, are, what is actually going on here? And, um, that's definitely measured by the client. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Um, I actually saw that I um, earlier was a question on from the audience to, to the um, student New Leipzig Talents program. I wanted to add on that. Um, it is an extracurricular program that we're having at HHL. And it's actually, as far as I know, starting every fall and you would have to apply for it. So it's not part of your study program um, for the person asking. It's an extracurricular program. And also I saw um, you had mentioned, uh, Susanna, already that um, you're involved with the executive education team at HHL already. And I also saw that somebody posted that there's a three and a six month a program that you can technically, if you're interested, um, anyone in the audience, you can get in touch with um, Susanna and her team and um, potentially uh, book a coaching yourself. So just wanted to wrap that up because I think I jumped over those two um, questions earlier. If there's nothing else that you would like to add from your end, um, Susanna and Olga, I would like to give you a virtual round of applause. Um, I think everyone, um, I, I can see everybody. I think everybody's agreeing with me. It was an absolutely insightful evening. Thank you very much, first of all, for your time um, for all um, your, your patient answering of all the uh, questions. And um, I enjoyed it very much and um, um, wanted to wish you a wonderful evening and thank you again for, for your wonderful evening. Thank you so much and uh, yeah, um, goodbye to the HHL folks here and uh, hope to see you maybe in Berlin or somewhere. So thanks so much also for the invitation and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Olga. Thank you, Susanna. And everybody, thank, thank you, you for coming and see you hopefully at the next HHL Expo talk, um, which will be posted very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.